So in this lecture, um, I'm going to introduce you to some of the basic characteristics of uninterrupted flow. But what is uninterrupted flow? Um, uninterrupted flow uh, represents a traffic flow that is usually um, not interrupted with traffic signals or a yield sign or roundabout, for example. So freeways um, or expressways um, are good examples of uninterrupted flow. Uh, freeways are usually defined as facilities that have or carry uninterrupted flow where there is full access control. So getting in and coming out of the freeway is totally controlled by the ramp. So you can't, there's no driveway um, getting into the freeway or, you know, there's no alley or, uh, so the control access, um, the access is really controlled. Uh, you can only get in with on-ramps and you can get off the freeways only through off-ramps. And there's no traffic signals or roundabouts, etc. cetera. Um, speaking of freeways, we have many different kind of segments on freeways. So first major segment is called merge, which we, it's called merge, where we have the main line and because of an on-ramp, a secondary traffic flow will merge into the main line traffic. We also have the opposite, which is called diverge, where we have the main line freeway and because of an off-ramp, um, some vehicles diverge and get into the off-ramp and leave the freeway. We have an interesting segment called weaving section or weaving segment on freeway, which is, the reason it's called weaving, it's because we have an on-ramp followed by an off-ramp. And what will happen here is that we have the main line traffic and the vehicles getting into the freeway from the on-ramp will merge to the main line. At the same time, some of the vehicles on the main line will change lane to actually leave the freeway. So because of this crossing behavior here, it's called weaving segment. We have another segment which we usually call lane drop, where the number of lanes drop. So for example, in this example, we usually, we, have, we, we initially have three lanes and then it drops to two lane. And then usually because of this drop, lane drop, we'll see a bottleneck forms here and congestion backs up. Uh, we have lane addition sometimes, which in the main line, we have two lanes in this example, and then it suddenly the road gets expanded to three lanes. Uh, and obviously the most simple and basic segment is the basic freeway segment, which it's only the main line with no ramps, with no lane drops and no weaving. Very simple, plain, uh, basic segment. Um, as I said, merge, merge segments or merge junctions are, 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 are a key element in the freeway system as they're usually a trigger to bottlenecks. Uh, they're likely to function as bottlenecks. Why is that? It's because if you have traffic on the main line and then some traffic comes from the merge and then they have to change lane and because they usually change lane with lower speed, the vehicles on the main line, when they get to the merging stream, they have to slow down. And because of that slowing down behavior, a bottleneck will get created and congestion may back up. There are some key design and operations elements when it comes to um, freeways. Um, it is very critical to know the demand of the main line and the ramps. Um, we need to be aware of presence of any upstream or downstream ramp, uh, as well as their distance to the uh, on-ramp or the merge section that we are trying to design and, and, and operate, and also of their demand. So if there is this on-ramp here, and if you want to operate or design this part of the road, you need to be aware of, is there any off-ramp downstream? Is there any, another on-ramp upstream of this little merge section? What are the demands? Uh, how far these uh, downstream and upstream ramps are to this merge section? Um, we also need to know about the something called, some, something that is usually called acceleration lane or auxiliary lane. So, so look at this little lane here. 
when the ramp gets connected to the main line. So this lane is called auxiliary lane or acceleration lane, where it provides sufficient space for vehicles who are coming from the merge, from coming, sorry, coming from the ramp to accelerate and speed up and then merge into the mainline traffic. So the length of this acceleration is important to know in design. Um, we also need to know what is the free flow speed on the ramp because that affects uh, the design of the length of the acceleration lane. If the speed of the ramp is very small, imagine mainline traffic is 100 km per hour. And if your free flow speed of the ramp is 30 km per hour, that means you need to provide enough space to vehicles to speed up from 30 km vehicle per hour, uh, sorry, 30, 30 km per hour to 100 km per hour. Uh, so they can accelerate and then merge to, to the main line. So you need to provide that enough space in the acceleration lane. So knowing the free flow speed of the ramp is very important, as of course the free flow speed of the main line as well. Um, and the difference really matters here and it, it may even have safety implications. So if your main line is going 100 kilometer and your ramp uh, plus the acceleration lane doesn't provide enough space and time for vehicles to speed up as much as 100 km per hour. Uh, that, that difference between the mainline speed and the ramp speed could create some safety issues. Site distances are important, if you remember from geometric design of the roads, uh, whether p drivers uh, have enough site distance when they want to merge, uh, and also other geometric elements like the slopes, uh, whether whether the main line is turning, um, etc. What I'm going to cover next is an analysis method um, for two conflictive streams, conflicting streams, or basically emerging section. Uh, how queuing forms um, and how queues propagate. Uh, what is the arrival and departure of each approach in this merge section? Um, then we have two conflictive streams here. So imagine in this system, uh, in this merge section, we have two traffic streams. One is coming from this ramp and the other one is coming from this ramp or this approach and then they merge into a single uh, main line. Um, and these two traffic streams compete in sending flows through this narrow restriction. Uh, let's first make a few assumptions of the system and then we'll start looking at how we can actually analyze that using a method called uh, envelope method, uh, which is proposed by Professor Carlos Daganza from UC Berkeley. Uh, so assumption one says, let's assume there is a maximum flow or service rate mu that can pass through the bottleneck. So mu is the maximum outflow of this merge section, downstream of the merge section. So we cannot have anything larger than mu downstream of this uh, merge section. The second assumption says if there is Q on either of the approaches, either approach one or approach two, then the combined outflow through the bottleneck is still mu, right? So if I have these two streams merging, if there is Q in either of them, either this is queued or this one is queued or both. The summation of the outflows here would be equal to the mu. That means the system tries to um, use all the available capacity downstream of the merge. So if there is a Q in one of the approaches and if the other approach is uncongested, the congested approach sends more flows uh, so the capacity of the bottleneck is actually fully used. Uh, so as I've described here, this means that either approach is wide enough to keep the restriction saturated on its own. Uh, that is, if there is a queue, then the outflow of the both approaches, D1 plus D2, is actually to mu. So again, if I draw the uh, two merging sections here, uh, each of the approaches has an arrival rate, right? The inflow. And then here I have D1 and D2. And the capacity of the downstream of the merge was mu, right? So here we say, if one of the approaches is 
congested or if there is Q on either one of the approaches at least, then D1 plus D2 is equal to mu. That means we try to we try to fully use the capacity of the merge. The other assumption is if there are Qs on both approaches, then the outflow rates, then the service rates are in a definite ratio, as if people took turns in the competition for using the bottleneck. So now imagine both of these approaches are congested rather than only one of them. Of course, still we have D1 plus D2 equal to mu, but because now there is a competition uh, between the two streams, we assume that there is a definite ratio. So for example, uh, D1 over D2 is a fixed number. If it's equal to one, that means one vehicle, when, when, when vehicles try to merge, uh, one vehicle from a stream one goes in, then a vehicle from a stream two goes, another vehicle from a stream one, and so on and so forth. Um, and because of that, we can introduce uh, mu one and mu two, which says uh, that is the capacity of, or the maximum outflow of approach one can be expressed as mu one, and the maximum outflow of approach two can also be expressed as mu two. And therefore, mu1 plus mu2 is actually equal to mu, right? And then mu1 over mu2 is equal to d1 over d2 in this case, because both approaches are congested. And that is assumed to be fixed, a fixed number, whatever number, one or half. Uh, I mean, it could it could relate to the number of available lanes on each of the streams. So imagine if, if a stream number one has three lanes and a stream number two has only one lane, what does this mean? What would be the ratio here? The ratio of mu1 over mu2 here. So this is this is one, this is two, and it I, I have three lanes here, and I have only one lane here. So it makes sense to assume that mu1 over mu2 here, it would be three lanes over one lane is three. That means uh, for every three vehicles that merge into the section from uh, a stream one, there is only one vehicle that merges in from a stream two, right? It totally makes sense. Uh, there is another assumption here before we get in get into the analysis method. Uh, if a stream does not have enough flow to maintain a queue, then the other stream will take up the slack and send additional flow. So if I have these two streams, if let's say a stream number two doesn't have enough flow, let's say it's D1 is very, sorry, D2, the departure or the outflow of a stream two is very small. And here it's D1, I have D1 here. What we can assume here is we can assume that this stream will take all the available slack and will send additional flow. So for example, if approach two does not have a queue when its arrival rate is A2, so in this case, A2 is smaller than the capacity of uh, stream two, right? So the outflow is actually D2. Uh, that is also smaller than mu2 in this case. We can say that d1 will actually grow beyond uh, mu, sorry, mu d1. So this is a stream one. d1 will exceed its capacity. I mean, it's a little bit hard to interpret because uh, we don't usually see uh, flows exceeding capacity in reality. But again, if capacity is not fixed, which isn't in reality, to be honest, uh, if that mu is not fixed, yes, we can see D1 grows beyond uh, any assumed uh, capacity, uh, any assumed fixed capacity. So in this case, we'll say this is stream one, because there is enough room downstream of this merge section, uh, it will send additional flow beyond mu one, so we can totally use uh, the available space uh, or the slack. So what we'll, what we'll see here, what we'll say here is that D1 will be equal to the capacity of the downstream of the merge, which was mu minus A2. So this is called slack, right? Whatever is available on the downstream of the merge. Uh, so the capacity was mu mu, whatever, uh, some, some small number of vehicles coming from a stream two, 
So that minus uh, mu or the capacity minus that a small number of vehicles, that means how many more uh, capacity is left unused. So in this case, we assume that uh, a stream number one will use all of this available space uh, and will send additional flows. Now, the question that we try to answer with this method that I'm going to describe is, can we predict how queues grow and dissipate given all these assumptions and description of this system? And the answer is yes. Uh, the envelope method that I'm going to describe uh, will help us predict how queues grow and dissipate. Uh, so we simply need to identify outflows that arise in every possible circumstance and then use the result to construct some uh, appropriate departure curves for both approaches. So let's have a look. Um, so we have this merge section on the right. We have a stream number one, a stream number two. We have the arrival rate into these streams. We have their departure rates going out of it. We also have the capacity of each approach, mu1 and mu2. So this is the capacity, capacity. And we also have the capacity of the merge. So that is called, let's call it a merge or bottleneck capacity. So the envelope method is on the left, where on the x axis I have flow of a stream one, and on the y axis I have flow of a stream two. So the envelope method gives us a gives us a tool that we can predict what would be the departure curves, what would be the departure rates uh, of each of these streams. So for example, imagine we are at point A1. So this is A1. What does A1 mean here? So it actually means, if I project it onto the x-axis, it means uh, the arrival rate of flow one is here. So this is arrival rate of one. And this is arrival rate two. Because arrival rate one is smaller than mu one here, so in, in this case I have uh, arrival one is a smaller than v1. What does it mean? It means a stream number one is not congested. The, the number of cars that are getting into, that are arriving at that stream number one is a smaller than the capacity. So there's no queue on uh, stream number one. Um, so that, what does that mean? That means the same number of vehicles who arrive can actually leave without any delay. So the departure would also be the same as the arrival in this case because it's not congested. However, stream number two, we have A2 here, which is greater than mu2 in this case, right? We see that this is mu2 here. Uh, this is mu2 here. A2 is much greater than mu2 here. That means in stream number two, we'll definitely have a lot of congestion. And in the assumptions that we went over, we talked about this situation, that if we have congestion on one stream and, and the other stream is not congested, we assume that the congested stream will use all the available space uh, downstream of the merge or basically use the slack, use the, use the available capacity to maximize, to fully use the total capacity mu. So what we can do is we can project this point into this line, which I'm going to describe what that is in a, in a second, and find out the um, find out the departure. So this would be the departure of uh, approach two, while this would be the departure of approach one. So look, we, we just found out, given this arrival one and arrival two, what would be the departure one and departure two. So that's what the envelope method does. We want to know 
what would be the departure rate of stream one and stream two when they merge. So let's go back to the, this graph on the left and let me tell you what this black bold line here is. So we said x-axis is the flow of a stream one, y-axis is the flow of a stream two. And this bold line here represents this capacity of the bottleneck, which always remains as, you remember we said mu one plus mu two is equal to mu and d1 plus d2 is always smaller and equal than mu as well. So this tells me what that mu is, right? So imagine if flow, in, uh, if flow of um, a stream one is zero, all the capacity of the merge can be used by a stream number two. So we'll be on this point. If flow of a stream number two is zero, all the capacity of downstream uh, merge can be used by uh, flows of a stream one. So we have these two points, mu, mu. And if you just draw the line and connect these two dots, this, um, this line here represents the, uh, the total capacity um, of the merge. And what is this line that we call service ratio line? Remember we said if both streams are congested, there is a fixed rate, rate, service rate ratio. And that is, let's say, mu2 over mu1 equal to whatever number we want to say, 2, 3, or even smaller than 1, whatever number. Like, let's say, depending on the number of lanes on each stream. Um, and that's this line here, this second line here that is here, um, that represents this definite and fixed ratio of the service rate. So let's go back to, now, now, now that we know these uh, lines on the graph, let's go, let's go back to the graph and say, okay, so we covered this A1 here. We said A1 represents a case where a stream number one is not congested while a stream number two is congested. So the arrival point is here. And if you want to get, if you want to, if you want to find out what is D1 and D2, if we are on this side of the envelope, we can project this point to this line here and say, yes, D1 would be equal to D, D1 would be equal to A1, while D2 would be on, on this line. Because we can't really exceed this line. We cannot be, look, this part of the curve, we cannot be anywhere here in reality because we have to be under or on top of this black uh, line uh, mu. So this is the maximum physical possible uh, capacity that can happen on that road, right? Because we have this capacity on this merge here. So nothing can happen on, on reality. Not, we, we will not have any departure point on that side of on this side of the curve so that's why we project to this line and my departure point will be here which gives me the d2 and d1 now imagine a case where we have a2 where what is a2 here a2 gives me uh, arrival of approach one is here arrival of approach two is now here and in both cases, A1 is greater than mu1, and we can see A2 is also greater than mu2. That means both streams are congested, right? If both streams are congested, what should we do? We say that they compete for the available space on the merge, and they follow this assumed mu2 over mu1 uh, ratio. So what we can do is, if we are on this side of the, if we are on this side of the um, if you're on this side of the curve or this diagram, we project this point, sorry. Uh, let me erase this a little bit. So we project this A2 point, small, small A2 point to this point on the intersection of the mu and the service ratio. So we project that point into this point here. And that would give me the departure one and departure two. So if, if my arrivals are here, the way I have to, the way I can find out what would be D1 and D2 is that I can 
project this into this point, and that means my D1 is actually equal to mu1, and my D2 is actually equal to mu2 here. I'm still on this line, I'm not exceeding it, but I'm also following that assumption that we'll have that definite service rate ratio uh, that we discussed. What about this A3 point here? So let's see what does that represents. If, if we are on this side of the diagram in terms of the arrivals, so that means my arrival one is here and my arrival two is here. So what does that mean? Arrival one is greater than mu one. So that means this time a stream one is congested while arrival two is smaller than mu two. So that means a stream two is not congested. So again, we have a case where one of the streams is congested and the other is not. So that means the congested stream will take all the available slack and will send additional flows. So in this case, we can project this point horizontally into this mu line and that would give me that would give me the departure one. And because a stream number two is uncongested, A2 is actually equal to D2. So departure with departure two would be here while departure one would be here. And again, look, departure one is greater than mu one in this case. Again, it's hard to physically interpret it, but here we say, uh, uh, stream number one will send additional flows beyond its capacity to fill the available slack in the uh, in the merge section. So this is how the envelope method uh, works. Um, I have an example here if you were a little bit uh, lost um, when I was describing how this works. Let's assume we have a merging section with uh, a stream number one and a stream number two, and we have the capacity mu one, capacity mu two, and we have the, fig, the, the capacity of the merge here. Um, let's consider the following cumulative count diagram as the arrivals, uh, which shows us, so on the, on the top, I'm showing the uh, arrival curves and departure curves. So this is the departure curves. Uh, this is D1 and this is D2. On the, on the top, uh, I'm showing you the arrival and departure curves for stream number one. On the bottom, I'm showing you the arrival and departure curves for the stream number two. Um, so let's go, let's go over this and see what each time period will tell us. So uh, and again, mu1 is the maximum uh, departure of uh, stream number one, and mu2 is the maximum uh, departure of uh, stream number two. So between zero and one, what do we see? We see arrival and departure is equal on both streams. A2 is equal to D2. So the, the curves actually superimpose. They're on top of each other. That's why you don't see two curves. You only, we only see one. So that means between A and uh, between zero and one, uh, none of the uh, streams are congested. So that means uh, A1 is equal to D1, A2 is equal to D2, and D1 plus D2 is uh, probably much smaller than the capital mu. Between time one and two, what happens? A stream one is still uncongested because arrival and departure are on top of each other, while a stream number two will see that some congestion form because the slope of this line increases. That means I have, remember the slope of the line represents the flow here, right? So the flow increases, the arrival flow increases, while the departure flow here, uh, is uh, smaller than the arrival. That means I have some congestion in this road. So that is where this point happens. For example, look, so, so, so stream number two is congested while stream number one is not congested. I actually have it here, I guess. Yes, so we'll be on this point. So which says between zero, between one and two, 
A stream number one is uncongested. So this would be arrival equal to departure while arrival two is large and we have to project onto this line to get what would be the departure. So this departure line here is actually D2, which comes from this projection of this point to this mu to this line to this mu line here. So I, I'll get the D2 here, and that would be the slope of this line. Let's see what happens from two to three. Oops, sorry. So two to three, I can see that the flow of the flow of uh, stream number one also increases. The slope increases, uh, and I see congestion. Uh, same thing happens in stream number two, where I still have congestion and arrival is much larger than departure. So that means uh, we are somewhere here probably. So this is between two and three, which the arrival one and arrival two are much larger than mu one and mu two. And if we are on this side of the diagram, what should we do if you want to get D1 and D2? We project this to this point and this gives me the D1 and D2. So this departure, this, this departure curve that you see here, D1 and this D2 here, uh, comes from, uh, would be equal to mu1 and would be equal to mu2 in this case. Uh, it comes from this D1 and D2 after I project this point into this uh, middle point here. What will happen from three to four? Uh, from three to four, I can see that the stream number one is still congested. So there's Q here because uh, the, there is a space between arrival and departure curve. While stream number two, the Q is, there's no longer a Q on it because arrival and departure curves superimpose um, once again. So that means arrival one is congested, arrival two is not congested. So we are probably somewhere here, um, here, which arrival one is A1, uh, which is much larger than mu one. So stream number one is congested, while arrival two is here, smaller than mu two, that means that is not congested. So what would be D1 and DQ? We need to project this point to this line and that would be my D1. And because the stream number two is not congested, so D2 is actually equal to A2. So this would be my D1 here, and this would be my uh, D2 here. So that's how we can use that envelope method with the cumulative plots of arrival and departures to actually, given this mu1 and mu2 given mu given the arrival curves uh, I want to know what is the departure curves for each um, stream and when I get this depart the actual numbers of this departure curves using this envelope method what would be the area between the arrival and departure if you remember from the previous lecture this gives me the total delay that stream number one is experiencing and the area between these arrival and departure curves on a stream number two gives me the total delay that the other stream is um, experiencing. And then I can also calculate what is the maximum queue length, what is the maximum wait time, how many vehicles are in this queue. So remember, the whole objective of the envelope method was I wanted to know, I wanted to predict how queues grow and dissipate uh, on each of these streams upstream of a merge. And with this method, we just managed to calculate all these D1 and D2s uh, on for, for different circumstances when both streams are congested, when one of them is congested, the other is not, to actually calculate the arrival and departure curves. And if you plot them and we calculate this area between them, we'll manage to calculate the total delay, the average delay per vehicle, et cetera. So I have enough description on the slide if you want to go over them on your own and uh, redo this example, uh, spend more time on it if it was a little bit hard to digest at the moment. But the, the description here is should be sufficient to uh, describe all the things that I just talked about. Um, so I leave that description to you to read. I don't want to repeat what I just said. 
Um, let's move on to the diverge part of the lecture. So we talked about merge. We went over a simple method called envelope method to better understand how uh, queues form and dissipate and discharge from merge sections. But when it comes to diverge, the literature, the scientific literature is not as vast as the, the, as the merge. We don't have many studies or many tools studying the diverge sections. Um, again, one reason would be because um, it is not like it is not as likely to see a bottleneck in diverge section. I'm not saying that we don't see bottlenecks there. Sometimes we see a typical example of a bottleneck forming at a diverge is when there is a signal downstream of the off ramp. And vehicles who go, who wants to exit have to have to stop because of this red light, and then suddenly a queue backs up, and then the queue spills back into the mainline freeway, and this becomes a bottleneck and a congestion forms here. So we don't necessarily always see bottlenecks on merges. We all we could also see some bottlenecks forming because of the diverge. But as I said, it's not as common as as merge sections. But again, not it's not totally. Uh, impossible to see bottlenecks here. So anyways, uh, the, the way diverge section works, as I said before, to, you, typically the total number of lanes, lanes are equal um, uh, or higher than the total number of lanes departing. So if I have three lanes coming here, suddenly it becomes four lanes, allowing some vehicles to change lane and then take the off ramp and leave. And then it goes back to three lanes again. Um, some common issues with diverge sections, as I touched on, is when the exit, when the exiting demand, when the, the number of vehicles that are taking the off ramp exceeds the capacity of the off ramp, whether because of a signal or because just demand is simply larger than the capacity of the off ramp, um, a spillback is created on the main line. So traffic will back up to the main line, and it will create a bottleneck here and it severely disrupts operations on freebase. Um, there is this paper from 1999 by uh, Gordon Newell, which is again, a very famous scientist uh, in, in, traffic, in traffic engineering on analyzing uh, some of the delays caused uh, at uh, exit ramps or off ramps. Um, it is totally based on arrival and departure curves or cumulative plots. So I encourage you to have a look at the paper. You can find the paper online or download it through UNSW library if you wish. Um, but I, I briefly I briefly described the method here so you know what kind of methods exist to analyze diverge sections. So the goal of the Newell's approach here when it comes to a diverge is to describe what happens to traffic on a freeway if a queue from an off ramp spills back into the freeway causing a partial blockage of the right lane or right lanes depending on how many lanes are exiting. So if a queue backs up from the off ramp and partially block the freeway, we want to analyze how would that impact the total inflow and the total outflow of the main line. So here we can consider two classes of vehicles. Uh, type number one or class number one uh, are the vehicles that are going through. So the main line or uh, through vehicles, we call them type one. And type two are the ones that are taking the exit. So exiting vehicles, uh, let's call them type two. So type one vehicles can travel in any freeway lane. They can be here, they can be here because they can continue going straight, right? But type two vehicles are assumed to stay on the right lane or right lanes, depending how many lanes are exiting the freeway. So, so, so all of these lanes can be occupied by type one vehicles, but type two vehicles are only using the right side of the freeway or either the, the farthest right lane or farthest right lanes of the freeways, of the freeway. So the way Newell's approach this problem is it says, how about for each of the vehicle types, 
we draw the arrival and departure curves. So he, we introduced D1 and D2 being the cumulative uh, departure plots of vehicle type one and vehicle type two that pass the exit ramp. Uh, and arrival one and arrival two is defined as the arrival curves of vehicle type one and vehicle type two uh, that um, could have passed the exit ramp if there were no exit queue. So it's basically the arrivals, right? So, and then you can see on this cumulative plot on the right, that we have the arrival curve for vehicle type one. We have the we have the arrival curve of vehicle type two in this example. And then we can draw the departure curves um, of the vehicle type one and the departure curves of vehicle type two. And then if we sum these up, you see. If we sum these two curves up, it would be we we find another curve which we can call a1 plus a2, and another departure curve which tells us d1 plus d2, to be able to analyze how would the whole diverged section work. So in this case, if you want to calculate the total delay for the whole diverged section, including both vehicle type one and type two, we just need to calculate the area between these two curves, right? Um, and that would give us the total delay because of the diverge. Or, or if you want to calculate the average delay, uh, we take this total total area divided by the total number of vehicles, uh, and that would give us the uh, average waiting time. Or if you want to calculate the maximum waiting time again, we look at the maximum horizontal line. If you want to calculate the total queue length on the main line or on the whole system, we look at the maximum vertical line. So we can do a lot of interesting analysis by just having these cumulative plots. Um, so again, I leave this Newell's, uh, I leave it to you to download this paper, have a closer look, uh, have a look at some of the figures in the paper, uh, read some of the descriptions, and um, you'll get to know more about Newell's approach. Uh, there's also another paper, paper, paper that I highly recommend you to have a look, um, which is again uh, has a focus on freeway diverge sections. Again, um, it's by some of our colleagues in UC Berkeley, uh, Carlos Munoz and uh, Carlos Dagonzo, um, uh, which um, the paper describes the behavior of a multi-lane freeway traffic upstream of an oversaturated off-ramp. This is exact. This is a paper exactly related to the case that I told you where we have a main line and we have an off-ramp and the off-ramp, uh, the capacity is a small because of a traffic light or whatever. So the traffic spills back into the main line and uh, it really disrupts the mainstream traffic on the, on the freeway. So the paper looks at uh, some empirical data from a freeway in California, I-8, 880 uh, in, in near Oakland, California, in San Francisco Bay Area, um, and looks how uh, the spillback from the off ramp uh, really disrupts the mainline freeway. So, again, I encourage you to have a look at this paper. They have very nice figures, uh, cumulative plots, trajectories, um, loop detector data, fundamental diagrams. So, uh, all of the things that you've learned so far in this course. Uh, you'll see that all of them are really relevant and powerful tools to analyze such complex problems. So if I want to show you some of the findings of the paper in summary, so they found that uh, this uh, um, uh, FIFO um, property of freeways is actually um, blocked. FIFO stands for first in first out system. I'm not sure if you've heard it before, but it's a very common terminology used in queuing system, where, where we have a queuing system. Um, it could follow a FIFO system we call, or a first in first out system, where the first vehicle who comes in, it would be the first vehicle who goes out. We have other queuing uh, logics, like it could be um, uh, FILO, uh, first in last out. For example, an elevator uh, with one door uh, is a good example of a first in, last out, because the first vehicle who goes into the elevator 
is probably the last person who leaves the elevator because if you, uh, you know, because the, the because the last person who gets into the elevator is closer to the door, so he or she leaves the elevator. But the first person is 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 in the, is in the back of the lift. So you see, we have different logics. But anyways, um, so the findings on the from the paper says that on freeways, on wide freeways, uh, when we have off ramp queues and the queue grows across all lanes, um, it will disrupt the FIFO system um, in freeway because look, for example, if I have multiple lanes and this lane is blocked for some reason because of the off-ramp, uh, if this vehicle arrives here early, but this, but this lane is actually partially blocked, this vehicle arrives here first, but then a minute later, another vehicle comes on another lane, and then it can pass through the off-ramp. So FIFO gets violated here because this vehicle who arrived first is not be able to leave first. Uh, however, the, the vehicle that arrives on another lane can actually leave earlier. So this FIFO gets violated. Um, they also found that capacity is variable. It's not really fixed. So under FIFO condition, the freeway discharge flow can actually change significantly without a change in the off-ramp flow. So what they've seen was that the capacity is actually changes um, from more than 5,000 vehicles per hour to 4,500 vehicles per hour. Uh, even when the exit uh, flow uh, goes down. So it's not necessarily just, just about the, the off-ramp flow, but just because of the movements, the microscopic movements, because of the diverge, the capacity will change significantly. And as I said, you'll see non-FIFO congested regimes forming, as I made an example. So here are some of the fundamental diagrams in that paper, if, if you, if you want to have a closer look, where they, uh, so you see, they have, this is, this, is, this is coming from empirical data from that freeway upstream of that diverged section, where they see a lot of points on the uncongested branch, and then they see uh, some kind of a maximum flow here with 7,500 vehicle per hour. And then suddenly congestion forms, and this point moves all the way to the congested branch and goes to 600, sorry, 6,300 vehicle per hour. And again, if you remember from the shockwave analysis that we've done in previous lectures, this, if I'm at this traffic estate, this is my traffic estate A, this is my traffic estate B, what would be the shockwave? The shockwave is actually the line, the speed of the shockwave is actually the line connecting these two traffic estates. The slope is negative, so it's a backward moving shockwave. And if I calculate the slope, which is QA minus QB over KA minus KB, uh, I can actually calculate the actual speed of the shock wave that is happening because of that off-ramp.